Okay, finally, we're gonna talk about true experiments that really get around all those limitations in the correlational techniques. Um, they avoid this third variable problem. They really demonstrate true uh, causal relationships. And the critical thing you need to do is, again, assign people at random to the different conditions because that random assignment breaks all the pre-existing associations that people have, all the things that are true about a person, all these third variables we have crawling all over us um, are kind of washed away by this random assignment process. Um, and uh, we have uh, one or more control conditions. So somebody who's not getting manipulated it, or at least getting manipulated in a different way. Um, and then you have a kind of manipulation condition where you do something and, and you're looking at the difference between those two populations. Um, and this gives you also control over confounds, these, these possible third variable problems. So here's how the study design looks. You have a set of pop possible subjects. Uh, you assign them at random into the experimental group or the control group. Um, you try to do as much as you can to, con to make the, the study and testing conditions identical, except for one independent variable, the cause, okay? This is the thing you're trying to understand as a potential cause. And in this case, we're looking at one group gets to listen to music, the other group doesn't get to listen to music while they're studying. Um, otherwise, the conditions are identical, so they can't be other factors going on that are causing the effect. And then you're measuring their test scores after this uh, study session, and that's telling you how uh, well they performed on this experiment uh, and if there is a difference, the only thing you can attribute that difference to is that individual, uh, that independent variable, the cause. Um, so this is really the fundamental logic of the experimental design used in all the different experiments that you see in science. Um, and it's really just isolating one thing that, that you want to focus on. And it's actually really hard in practice to make sure that you independently, uh, that you narrow everything down to that one independent variable. You can say, well, is it the music? Is it the fact that the music makes people uh, happier? It brings up mental association. So you don't know why the music might be making a difference. Um, and, and so there's lots more that you need to understand, but at least it helps you narrow down the range of possible causal variables. Fundamental elements of an experimental design are the independent variable, which is what you manipulate. It's the thing you're looking at as a cause. And then the dependent variable, the thing you measure, um, that's the effect. Last of all, we're going to talk about the, the statistics that you use. And so the logic here, again, you'll learn about this more if you go on and, and, and learn about statistics. It's just a brief overview of this. But the key point is that you want to understand if that difference that you observe between the experimental condition and the control condition is actually due to the manipulation you did, or rather it could just be due to random noise. And there's always a bunch of random noise. People behave differently. And that's where we have to use that width of the distribution to understand if that difference falls outside of that 95% of data points that we would expect by chance, then you say, well, you know, there's only a 5% chance that this result that I got is due to that random chance. And therefore, 95 out of 100 times, I'm going to be right by saying this was really an effect, for example, of music in that one study. Um, and that's really what these tests do. There's a t-test that was actually originally developed to test uh, differences uh, in uh, Guinness beer. So trying to evaluate different ways of brewing and, and different ingredients. And, and they developed the statistics in that case. So very practical context and very interesting history there. Um, the f-test or the ANOVA analysis of variance allows you to look at multiple different factors. Um, and then the, the kind of integrated mega test of all of these is something called the generalized linear model, which actually subsumes uh, correlation as well as these kinds of uh, inferential tests and is the kind of thing you typically learn in grad school that kind of integrates all forms of statistics in one big test. Okay, so again, you don't really need to know the details of how this works, but just having a familiarity of what these statistics are. These are the things that really get reported in these experimental studies over and over again. And in the case of neuroscience, uh, as opposed to the neuroimaging techniques, uh, there are causal techniques that are used in humans 
to manipulate the brain, right? And so then we get to, to have a experimental condition that, for example, has this magnetic stimulation turned on and that changes neural activity in a particular area of the brain. And so we can understand, you know, what that area of the brain might be doing in terms of the effects of this manipulation on behavior. Um, and it's kind of like a temporary lesion. The problem is that this TMS approach uh, is not actually uh, very localized and it's not clear if it's actually stimulating or exciting uh, versus inhibiting. Um, and so it creates this kind of new artificial pattern of activity. And that's exactly the problem that we see in general with experimental approaches. It tells you about causality, tells you if there's an effect of putting this magnet on your head, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what this thing does in the normal brain when you don't have a magnet on your head. Uh, so there's always all these trade-offs. You never, you never really get around those trade-offs. Uh, one of the reasons we do so much work with animals is because you can do much more invasive techniques with like rats. Uh, rats are considered a pest um, and nobody complains when you, you know, kill rats for uh, pest control. Uh, and in science, you can you can kind of take advantage of that and do uh, all these invasive techniques like change their genes and get them to express these little uh, photoreceptors on individual neurons. These are specific neurons that that uh, are only in one part of the brain. And if you shine a laser, of course, you get laser light. This is really awesome. Um, it'll either activate or inhibit, depending on which genes you had expressed, that specific subset of neurons. And that's amazing. So this really gets around a lot of these potential uh, uh, mis, uh, areas of misinterpretation and gets you really to understand the causal effects of individual subsets of neurons in the brain. So this was developed, uh, you know, now maybe about 10 years ago and has really revolutionized the field of uh, neuroscience. So we know a lot more about how different brain circuits work at a causal level as a result of this optogenetic uh, technique. There's a few other just last minute issues here. Uh, you know, there's this famous quote about there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. Uh, people can manipulate the way that, that data is presented to emphasize one result or another. One of the most important ones that you'll see all the time is manipulating kind of the range of data displayed. Uh, and so here you can see that there's a very narrow range of data displayed, and it looks like there's a big effect of whatever this is. But here you can see if you plot the data at its full range starting at zero, the effect, relatively speaking, is a kind of ratio of the bar size seems pretty small. And actually, it's hard to know really what is the most appropriate way to present the data. But you just have to be aware. Look at the ranges of the data being plotted and think about, is that a sensible range? Does that change the way I interpret this data? Finally, you may have heard of the replication crisis, which has uh, been increasingly getting media attention in the last five, 10 years. And it's really a recognition of systematic biases in the field of science that allow data to be published over and over that doesn't really meet this same kind of criterion of less than 5% chance being due to random chance uh, of the result being due to chance because of systematic biases in the way that science works. And so people uh, will tend to publish results that are interesting counterintuitive, surprising. They tend not to publish results that uh, don't replicate other studies or that don't uh, seem that interesting. And so there's a huge filter on what you see in publications. And when you take into account that filter, plus all the incentives that go in, the human incentives in terms of jobs, uh, who gets promoted, who gets a bigger salary, all these different effects, uh, play into and, and cause people to publish data in a way that results in the kind of typical false positive rate, we call it, uh, the, the probability of publishing something that probably isn't true is estimated to be as high as 50%. So 50% of the studies in published journals may be not replicable. They may not be real effects because of all these systematic biases that are present in the field. And so there's been a growing awareness of this and a growing emphasis on actually replicating data. And this, as we talked about before, is such a critical aspect of what makes science work. Um, and you know, as you can see in, in the real world, 
as more and more different uh, studies are published, it's harder and harder to replicate all of those different studies. And so there's real practical limitations on how much the scientific method can be actually be implemented. Um, and so, but there is at least a growing recognition that these are real problems. One of the main techniques that people are using is to uh, pre-specify exactly what they're gonna do with their data so that they don't introduce any biases into the way that they analyze. This is called pre-registration. Um, and so that that prevents some of these biases from entering into the publication process. So in summary, there's a lot of opportunity for critical thinking and really trying to think carefully about what is the data telling you? What are the possible alternative interpretations of the data you're looking at? What are the possible biases that uh, people writing the studies may have introduced in their presentation of the data, in the hypotheses that they were entertaining in the first place? Um, did they mistake you know, the uh, correlation that they found for some kind of causal effect um, all of these questions are really important to ask yourself. And again, you'll see this data in, in, discussed in the popular press and the media does not do a very good job of emphasizing these critical points of interpretation. So by understanding how science works and how uh, this data is analyzed, uh, you can think more critically about all the data you see in your, in your daily uh, life and uh, be a better consumer, a more informed consumer of all this data.